Agatha Christie is the most widely published author of all time and in any language, outsold only by the Bible and Shakespeare. I'm gonna humor this old man because he's past his prime and he doesn't know what he's talking about. a day off coming up, so what better way to spend it than doing a 24-hour reading vlog? And in this one, I'm going to focus on reading only books by Agatha Christie. In this 24 hours, from the moment I wake up until the moment I go to bed, I'm going to be hanging out with Agatha Christie. I'm going to see how many of the Poirot books I can get through. I also may do a little movie dinner date night to stay on theme. The day after that readathon, I also have a lunch planned with my mom. I bought her the first Poirot book, and so we're gonna get together and chat about it. She said she did not guess the killer, and she's normally really good at that. So I'm really excited going into this to see if I can beat my mom and guess the killer. It's not likely though, I'm so bad. But that means I also really enjoy mysteries because they always catch me off guard and surprise me. I'm going to keep this reading vlog spoiler free, so fear not, I'm not going to tell you who the killer is, but if you are interested in a spoiler filled Agatha Christie reading vlog video, I saw one done by How to Train Your Gavin where he read some of her popular ones and he talked about it as he was reading it and if he could guess the killer or what he predicted would happen. And it was a lot of fun. So I'm gonna link that video down below. So after you watch this one, you can check his out. Let's get started and see if we can solve some crime. Okay, I just got out of bed, kicking off this readathon at 8 a.m. with book one from the Poro series. Gonna try to go in order as much as possible. But I have this one and it's not too long, so I think it'll be easy to get through it. But then I also have the audiobook for the second Poirot book. So I'll be able to mix things up, still get some things done today. So that is where I'm kicking things off. I am so upset. My AirPods slipped out of my ear in the pool in the deep end. <laughs> so I'm trying to dry them out in some rice. They were like in the deep end and like I can't dive that far. So I had to have my boyfriend <laughs> dive down and get them. So please pray. Pray for my AirPods that this works. It says they're waterproof, but I don't know if like up to 10 feet is what they mean. It's about 12.30 and I just finished the first book in my Agatha Christie readathon, The Mysterious Affair at Styles. 
In this one, we follow the point of view of Mr. Hastings, and the way he's writing it, he tells us that he is reaccounting everything that happened on behalf of Hercule Perrault. So he's like writing it down or documenting it somehow. But Mr. Hastings is going to this estate called Styles to stay with an old friend of his, and naturally, there's a death that occurs. And everyone's kind of torn if it's a natural death, like heart failure, or if it's a murder. But um, kind of, spoiler alert, it's a murder. It was poison. On page 22 of this book, we have a little bit of a physical description of Hercule Perrault. Poirot was an extraordinary looking little man. He was hardly more than five foot four inches, but carried himself with great dignity. His head was exactly the shape of an egg, and he always perched it a little to one side. His mustache was very stiff and military. The neatness of his attire was almost incredible. I believe a speck of dust would have caused him more pain than a bullet wound. Yet this quaint, dandified little man who, I was so sorry to see, now limped badly, had been in his time one of the most celebrated members of the Belgian police. As a detective, his flair had been extraordinary, and he had achieved triumphs by unraveling some of the most baffling cases of the day. And that's interesting because I always thought Perot was French. He's Belgian. So I learned something. Poirot, of course, has a reputation for being brilliant, but even his trusty friend Hastings doubts him a little bit. And on page 60, the idea crossed my mind, not for the first time, that poor old Poirot was growing old, privately. I thought it lucky that he had associated with him someone of a more receptive type of mind. So I love that Mr. Hastings thinks that he has cracked the case and he knows what's going on and Perot is losing his touch because he's old. I'm not sure how old he is actually. I don't think they said it. And I don't have like a vision in my mind of how old he is. But I think that's so funny that he's just like, I'm gonna humor this old man because he's past his prime and he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not catching everything. And of course, you know that Perot is quite brilliant. Um, I mean, that's why he's the detective. That's why he has his own series. So I think that was kind of cute. In one of their conversations, we did have Poirot's methodology where he's saying that it's pretty smart to go through and kind of accuse everyone in your mind. Say like what their motive would be, how they would have done it, and that's a really good way to be a detective and find out who done it. Uh, so I think that was really interesting because that's something that's signature with Poirot's style is to accuse everyone. And normally like he does it like to their face, but just in their conversation with each other, they go through everyone that is involved that could have possibly done it. And I really like that style. Agatha Christie is also quite famous for not discovering forensic science, but kind of being ahead of forensic science. And so I've been keeping an eye out for different hints of that throughout this book. And there were kind of like two things. I mean, at least two, there were several, but uh, one I wanted to mention is Poirot takes a sample of like coffee grounds or remnants from different cups and puts them in little test tubes and like does a test on them to test for poison. So I thought that was definitely like forensic. The second thing is he was also comparing fingerprints and I imagine it like with a magnifying glass because I'm sure computer technology was not around in like the 1920s, I think when this was written, uh, but comparing fingerprints to see which one was a match. So that was interesting as well. I did not guess the killer in this one. I said before I'm really bad at guessing, so I didn't think that I would, especially if my mom couldn't guess it, but I was right in a lot of suspicions. I think with these types of mysteries, you cannot take anything for granted. So if a witness is recounting a conversation, but they only heard one side of it, say like someone's on the phone, right? And you just make assumptions of who they're talking to based on a couple of keywords they say, you cannot make any assumptions. You have to take absolutely everything for face value. So some of the things that came up, I was right to suspect them and say, I don't know if that's really how it went down or I think that's an assumption. I was right with those clues. I just wasn't right with like the actual culprit and how they did it. So this was a great one. I really enjoyed it. I am revved up for more because I was so smart in identifying some of these clues, I guess. So I want to see if I can guess a killer at least once. That would be that would be awesome. 
I am stressing. Okay, so on the back, there's a list of the Hercule Poirot books. And so this was the order I was planning on reading them. But like, I was just looking through the final pages of this. And it says that it's possible to read the Poirot stories in any order. But if you want to consider them chronologically in terms of Poirot's lifetime, do this order. Which is fine because that's what I just finished. And then that's what I was planning on reading next. But then what the hell, I don't have this one. I kind of have to go with the reading order on the back because that's why I bought these ones. I was following this. So like, that's what I'm gonna do. And then I have this audiobook, the big four. So, um, I just, I don't know. I feel bamboozled. It's about 8.40 and I just finished Murder on the Links. And uh, needless to say, but I did not guess the killer. Again, there were so many twists in this one. There was, there was no way. It was never gonna happen. I mean, similar to the first one, I was right in thinking some certain people and some certain events or situations were suspicious but didn't link who the killer was or how they did it. Gosh, it was really smart. It was a really, really smart mystery. With Agatha Christie, it can be a little bit confusing because there are so many characters. That's why I think I prefer reading her books physically rather than audio because there's just so many people to keep track of. I kind of need to go back and reference them, especially because they're like all introduced in the first chapter. And because there are so many characters and she wants you to suspect so many people, a lot of them have secrets they're trying to hide. They could all be criminals or hiding something, but it's not necessarily murder. So that's a lot of fun, like finding out the secrets that everybody's holding because you think they might be the one you're looking for, but not really. In Murder on the Links, we have the trusty assistant Hastings and he's kind of a twit like he's really distracted by the ladies homeboy needs a girlfriend because yeah he's making some bad decisions in murder on the links someone writes perot a letter they want to hire him retain his services because they have some kind of a secret 
and they feel in danger because of it. But by the time Poirot gets there, this person has just been found stabbed in the back and found face down in like an open grave on a golf course. And Poirot feels that even though he didn't get there in time to protect his client, he still owes it to them to solve this crime. As that little snippet showed in the checklist of all the books, it says that you can read these in any order. And I agree, in book two, it mentioned the crime of the first book, but simply in terms of, did you hear about the case at the Styles? Poro solved that because he's so smart. So you can really read these in any order. I hope, because if there's Easter eggs, I'm worried about reading them out of order and missing out. You know what else is funny about books in this time period is how they feel like Brandy solves everything. I mean, in the first book, when someone was having a fit, like having seizures, they're like, get her some Brandy. And then in this one, when someone faints, they give her brandy and I'm like, uh, why? I don't know. It's creeping up on 9 p.m. right now, so I don't know how long I'll be able to stay awake for book three, but I'm gonna try to crack this one open. I'm upset, I'm upset I haven't been able to guess a killer yet. And again, I know I said that I'm horrible at it, so I guess I didn't expect to. But um, I was kind of hoping I, I might. So I'm going to go ahead and start this one. I don't know if I'll be able to finish it, but let's see where the night takes me. and I am struggling right now. The thing about a mystery is it requires so much brain power and um, it's taken me a long time. Okay, well that 24 hour Agatha Christie readathon kind of got away from me. I had totally forgotten that it was my bi-weekly happy hour date night. And that threw things off because obviously I wasn't reading. And then um, I had a lot of wine <laughs> and it made me super sleepy. So I couldn't stay up as late as I wanted. So I kind of failed, but made up for it because I had the Agatha Christie book club with my mom the next day. That was a lot of fun. She read the first Poirot book as well. Didn't guess the killer, uh, but we had fun talking about the different clues and the different twists and made me enjoy it so much more to like look back on it and have someone to talk to about it. I also had my Death on the Nile movie night, so that was a lot of fun, right on theme, and really helps encourage the imagery I have of the 1920s, Perot's mustache. <laughs> so that was really fun and special to continue on the theme. And I also had a chance to read a little bit more of book three, since I epically failed in the 24 hours. But something interesting to mention about Poirot Investigates, it's not one mystery. It is a collection of short stories where every chapter is a different Poirot case. I think that's kind of interesting. It's not as intricate with as many like twists and red herrings as like the full on books, but very quick paced, fun, brilliant. Poirot is just a master, right? So this is kind of fun. It's a very different vibe. 
Something else that I really adore about these specific editions that I have is that they have like an introduction and then like an interview at the end with Agatha Christie. So I'm getting so much more information from these editions. So for example, in this one, in the like about the author page, it says that Agatha Christie is the most widely published author of all time and in any language outsold only by the Bible and Shakespeare. That is some amazing girl power. I love to see it. So we have that fun fact. And then in this one, it talked about how Agatha Christie only started writing Poirot books because her sister bet her that she couldn't write a good mystery story. And so she really did it to prove someone wrong. I think that's awesome. And then in this one, as I mentioned, kind of like the interview with Agatha Christie, this section is Agatha Christie talking about what she thinks Poirot's favorite cases would be. Love that perspective. Ultimately, how did the readathon go? Well, when it comes to the three books that I read or attempted to read, they did not knock out my favorite Agatha Christie so far. So my all time favorite, it's not a Poirot book, but, and then there were none. So smart, fast paced. There's a lot of characters, but I love everything about this book. This is a perfect book for me. And so I loved the Poro books I read, but nothing tops this one as my number one favorite. After this one, Murder on the Orient Express is an all-time favorite. I love this mystery. I love an isolated setting just like that one. Really awesome. This is a Poro book. A lot of suspects. I love the ultimate reveal so much. So Murder on the Orient Express remains at number two. And then also Perot, Death on the Nile. I like this one. I think the murder was so creative, so well thought out. I don't support crime, but uh, props to the person that planned that. Also kind of terrifying that like Agatha Christie can think of all these things. That's pretty twisted. So that means and number four is one that I read from this readathon, and that is The Mysterious Affair at Styles. I thought the unveiling of this was so smart. I really liked it. I thought that was really good. So I enjoyed that one a lot. So that's number four. And then Murder at the Links. This one is number four because, again, I really liked it, but there was like no way possible, I think, that you can guess like the murderer and the motive because I feel like it wasn't like, really tough to guess clues. It's like information that you wouldn't have, right? So this one was great, but difficult to solve, right? And then last place, and it may not even be fair because I haven't finished it yet, um, but with short stories, I don't think I'm gonna have that like blown away impression that I do with all of those. I mean, all of those blew me away because like the plot twists were so smart, so much intelligence in those books. There's intelligence in this, but like each one is like a chapter. So how intricate can it be? Um, it's good. I'm enjoying it. If you're in the mood for short stories, you'll enjoy it too. But um, it's my least favorite. Doesn't mean I don't enjoy it. Just I just love the other ones so much. Ultimately, even though I didn't read as much as I wanted to in the 24 hour period, I didn't get through as many of the books. I thought for sure I would crush four, maybe five. And I disappointed myself because I didn't accomplish that. But it was successful in that I truly enjoyed everything I read. I have a stronger understanding of Agatha Christie thanks to like the introductions and the interviews at the back of those editions, but also just seeing the pure genius of her books. And you have to remember when these were written. I think that Mysterious Affair at Styles was written in 1916 and takes place in 1917 and it was published in 1920. So you really have to put this into the perspective of the time period, like how advanced some of this stuff was, both like forensics and the plot twists, but also just the different characters and how progressive they were for this time period. It adds just so much appreciation to her work. She is a brilliant, brilliant author. 
So I choose to look at it from that perspective. By terms of theme and enjoying what I read and understanding an author better, it was a super successful 24 hour reading vlog. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and hopefully I've inspired you to give Agatha Christie a try. And if you've already read some of her work, maybe you can check out some of her lesser known Poirot books because they're so much fun and they're so different. So thanks so much for hanging out with me and I will see you in the next video.